Good evening from the Warner Theatre in Leicester Square, where the crowds are already beginning to gather because James Bond is back. The real James Bond. At least, the real one in many people's eyes. Not Roger Moore, the pretender who has usurped the role for the last 12 years, but the original Sean Connery. And don't worry, he wasn't killed off in... The Battle of the Bonds, 1983. Roger Moore was starring in Octopussy, the 13th instrument of the official Eon Productions that would end up competing with an unofficial rival production starring Sean Connery. A rare occurrence and the only time in history fans could be seeing two different Bond films in cinema. Connery made it very clear he only returned one last time in the role of Bond in Diamonds Are Forever, 12 years prior. Despite being the original Bond, the most beloved and highly regarded as the best one, he was quite fed up with the role and almost seemed to have grown a grudge against the producers. When asked if he was ever going to return, he famously said, never again. But now, rival producer Kevin McClory had won him back, promising him creative input in the casting and script which apparently interested Connery enough because he returned once again and it was his wife that said the movie should get the ironic title Never Say Never Again and thus the unique unofficial Bond film Saudi Daylight. And after an intriguing legal battle over the rights to make this film, the one Bond story which is not controlled by the famous consortium of Broccoli and Saltzman. For in fact, Never Say Never Again is a remake of the 1965 tale of political terrorism, Thunderball. There's a long and complicated story concerning lawsuits and legal issues on how an unofficial Bond film came about. The short version is that during the 1950s, before any of the Bond films were made, Fleming was discussing plans with producer Kevin McClory to produce the very first James Bond film. And the movie never got made and the ideas were shelved. So Fleming went on to write his latest novel at the time, which was Thunderball. McClory claimed that Fleming used several of the ideas from their screenplay in that novel and he sued Fleming for it. He won the court case and he got the rights to the story of Thunderball, which is also why Eon Productions were forced to bring him in as a producer when they made Thunderball in 1965. Now, years after Thunderball was made, the rights to the story of Thunderball and the criminal organization Spectre all reverted back to McClory. So he was ready to make his rival production, a remake of Thunderball with the original James Bond at his disposal, along with the director of The Empire Strikes Back, Irvin Kirshner at the rear. McClory had all the ingredients to produce a major blockbuster and pack a serious punch to Octopussy. Of course, with the film not being produced by Eon Productions, it couldn't possibly start off with a gum barrel or hefty James Bond theme, but the film starts off particularly dull with, in my opinion, the worst Bond title song by Lani Hall playing over a couple of Shilluetta 007 logos. In my review of Octopussy, I stated that that was my least favorite song of all the Bond films of the 80s, but I was saying of all the official Bond films of the 80s, because this song just takes the cake for me. It's a shame because there was a much better title song by Phyllis Hyman that got rejected. I'll never say never again. There's no way to know the ways of love. I'll never say never again. The same holds for the score of the film, done by Michael Legrand, who gave this movie this complete out of place jazzy soundtrack. There also was a much better composer, James Horner considered, who would later be composing the score of movies such as Star Trek, Titanic, Avatar and much more. Already there was just so much missed potential here. Anyway, the film soon starts with Bond sneaking around in the woods to infiltrate some facility in a tropical setting. We see him do some stealthy stuff like throwing a frisbee, traveling across a cable, blowing a stun dart into a guy's head and strangling another guard to death. 
And none of this is really tense whatsoever, as the Never say never again, never horrendous song is shitting all over this scene. Why on earth did the filmmakers think it would be a good idea to have the title song playing over the opening scene? Imagine if the official Bond films were like that. It just takes away all the tension and makes it more of a montage. So Bond starts shooting his gun around, which appears to not really fire whatsoever, and he, he finds a damsel in distress who he soon rescues, but it turns out she has a knife and she stabs Bond. And then it's revealed we were just watching a routine training exercise, and M is showing the playback on a television. Oh, so that's why Bond's gun didn't have an actual burst when he was shooting all of this, was just practice. But how about the guy he strangled to death, or the freaking knife that the chick stabbed him with? And where was his training exercise taking place anyway? And who has filmed all this footage they're rewatching? Yeah, whatever, I'm already overanalyzing here, but the basics is that Bond failed the exercise and M is really pissed off at him. M, by the way, is played by Edward Fox in this movie and he is a real dick. He basically has no faith in Bond whatsoever and he wants him to go to a health clinic to get back into shape. There's also some actress playing Moneypenny who really could have been any girl and is forgotten as easily as he enters. So much like in the original, Thunderball, Bond goes over to the health spa Shrublands. In this film, however, Connery's age and condition is actually acknowledged, which is an interesting theme. We know Connery looks like a senior agent by now, so it's good on the movie's part to actually reference this as well. I think Connery looks pretty good in this film, by the way. Sure, he's middle-aged now and stuff, but he honestly looks better to me than when we last saw him 12 years earlier in Diamonds Are Forever, and his humor is still on point too. Mr. Bond, I need a urine sample. If you could fill this beaker for me. From here? Meanwhile, we're introduced to probably the best thing of this film, Fatima Blush, played by Barbara Carrara, who is this film's incarnation of the original Fiona Volpe, and is, dare I say, almost even better than the original. Carrara plays her in an eccentric manner with weird clothing choices and subtle sexiness, and I really dig her character. She's a member of Spectre, and we follow her along into the Spectre meeting room, which, compared to the grand and badass can Adam film set in Thunderbolt, looks like a boring pity Tupperware party for middle-aged people. There's also a Blofeld in this film, who is played by Max von Zitto, who doesn't really do anything special, but at least he's not seen in drag or making clones of himself, so he's still better than Charles Grey but I would have preferred it if they just kept him faceless for this one. Anyway, the villain's plot is the same as in Thunderbolt. They want to steal two nuclear warheads from the US Army, hide them somewhere in the world and ransom the world with them by threatening to use them. And we also get this film's version of Largo, who is played by Klaus Braundauer and has a completely different take on Largo than the original one. But hey, at least it's... different? Meanwhile, in Shrublands, Bond is already hitting on the nurse and soon gets her into bed. Not by blackmailing her like in the original though. This time he opens his briefcase filled with vodka and suave dishes, which apparently is enough to drop her panties. And in the meantime next door, Fatima Blush is beating up some guy named Jack Patachi. And he has had eye surgery and has his eye fixed up to match with the President of the United States, which is all part of Spectre's plan in stealing the nukes. Which is over the top, but I can't really say that the plastic surgery clone guy that they used in the original was much better. There's also this weird moment of Bond pulling the shade up while he's spying on Patachi, causing Fatima to soon spot him with some night goggles, and she apparently instantly recognizes him. I mean, what the hell was that all about? Why would Bond spook the bad guys like that? So in the morning, Bond is spending some time in the gym of the health clinic when some random superpowered henchman appears and starts fighting Bond. And he's presented as the indestructible type, where weights even bounce off his chest, giving Bond virtually no chance to beat him. I like the little moment in between the fight though, where Bond is getting his ass kicked and the crowd in the clinic are just watching some random football match, and the old granny doesn't seem to give a fuck about this giant beast of a killer standing behind her. <laughs> Eventually Bond and the big dude end up fighting in some lab and Bond gets the upper hand. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's an okay joke that Bond beats the guy with his piss, but still though, all the glass all of the sudden being stuck in his back just makes little sense, and Bond pretty much beat the guy on sheer luck instead of actual skill. And the fight causes M to be a dick again. That is the kind of attitude that tempts me to such pen you, 007! I mean, M in the official series bosses Bond around too, but he always regards him as his best agent and he has the highest faith in him. Oh no sir, not possible. He was seen boarding the Vulcan, took off last night. If 007 says he saw Deval last night at Shrublands and he was dead, that's enough for me to initiate inquiries. But anyway, Jack Patachi uses his fake president eye to enter some secret computer in the US Air Force to allow the nuke dummies to be filled with live nuclear warheads instead, and in this movie they are being remote controlled and fly over to be held in Spectre's procession in a really dated scene. And Patachi gets killed by Fatima Blush afterwards by having a snake being thrown into his car and then being blown up later after the snake got out. She could have just placed the bomb on his car beforehand, but, but yeah, so that happens. So Spectre have now stolen the nukes and is ransoming NATO and I can't help but find it hilarious how everybody is so concerned when they watch their ransom video, well they basically only get to see Blofeld's cat throughout the entire thing. I mean if I were in that room I'd probably be laughing the whole video. And so M is forced to put someone on the job to recover these nukes before Spectre used them to destroy major cities. And for some reason he chooses 007 for the job. Honestly I'm almost surprised. This M has been nothing but an absolute dick to Bond, clearly showcasing he has no faith in him or in his abilities whatsoever. I mean even during the mission briefing he doesn't take Bond serious. If this Patachi was involved, is it conceivable that he could have used a false eye? Oh, do come along, Bond. Let's think of a more logical explanation, shall we? And yet, for whatever reason, he puts the one agent he doesn't think is capable of anything good on this most important life-threatening mission. Sure. Much like in Thunderball, our villain Largo has his own private boat. This time it's not called the Disco Volante, but the Flying Saucer, which means the same. And this Largo has this perfect bunker installed where he does stuff and mostly spies on his own chick Domino while she's dancing. And this version of Domino is played by Kim Basinger, ba Basinger, ba Basinger? I'm not quite sure how to say this. Kim Basinger, ba Basinger, ba Basinger? Basinger? Huh. And her version of Domino is just plain and nothing special. She pills in comparison to Claudine Auger's Domino, who was much more exotic and vulnerable and... Did I mention that she's really hot? This Domino, however, seems to be really in love with Largo instead of just being a prisoner, and she gets this special bracelet from him, and it's called the Tears of Allah, which becomes involved in this film's plot a bit later. So meanwhile, Bond gets his gadget from this movie's Q, who, unlike M, is a lot of fun to watch. He's no Desmond Llewellyn, but he does give his Q his own touch. I hope we're gonna have some gratuitous sex and violence. I certainly hope so too. The Q scene is one of the more fun scenes to watch in this film and Bond gets a laser watch and a pen that fires miniature missiles, which is pretty cool. So off Bond goes to the Bahamas, and I'm not even sure if it's really explained in this one why Bond even needs to go to the Bahamas. In Fundable, Bond requested to go there himself as he found a lead that caused him to believe that he needed to look there for the nukes. But in this one, it just seems to be randomly sent out there. It's also here where we get to see Mr. Bean himself, Rowan Atkinson as Bond's contact in one of his first roles. I say, Mr. Bond! Nigel Smallfoot, British Embassy, Nassau. How'd you do, Nigel? Sorry, I'm late. But as you're one of these undercover Johnnies, I took the precaution of not being followed. And that's why you shouted my name across the harbor. Oh, God, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Damn! Damn! Sorry, I'm rather new to all this. It's pretty fun because you do get to see some of the roots of Atkinson's signature style that later became so prominent in his acting. Bond also meets up with Fatima Blush who is out water skiing and ends up in Bond's arms only for him to utter my favorite line in the entire movie. How reckless of me. I made you all wet. Yes, but my martini is still dry. My name's James. It's such a cool line and I can only wish that I would one day find myself in a situation in which I can finally say the line myself. 
And Bond seems to go with Fatima Blush for no real reason, but I guess he doesn't really have much other leads to go on, so whatever. He starts banging her on board of a boat in probably the weirdest sex scene in a Bond film, which is soon followed by scuba diving, because a fundable remake wouldn't be complete without that stuff of course. And they start swimming around some shipwreck for no real reason at all, and this time Fatima doesn't throw in a snake, but has radio controlled sharks chase Bond. And even though that might sound cool, it never really gets gets tense at all and Bond soon shakes them off anyway and ends up with a random chick who he was flirting with earlier and she happens to be fishing exactly where Bond was. So Fatima tries a second assassination attempt by placing a bomb under Bond's bed, but as he blows it up it turns out Bond was actually in the hotel room of the random chick, which is something I do really like. And that's all Bond really does in the Bahamas though, as Mr. Bean tells him to go over to the south of France, as that is where Lago's boat is at the moment, so Mr. Bean was essentially doing a much better job than Bond was doing. So off to the south of France we go then, and Bond is traveling with this movie's version of Paula, who is called Nicole and doesn't really do much. And we also meet up with Felix Leiter, who is actually pretty decent compared to the majority of the Leiters in the official series. And so Bond starts shadowing Domino in one of the most ridiculous jokes of the film where Domino walks past this tree and it turns out Bond was standing behind it. It's like Looney Tunes humor. You end up laughing out loud just because it's so bad. So Domino is having a massage and Bond poses as a masseuse in a pretty perverted scene. Mm. Bond does get some information on Largo though, and he learns that he's hosting a party at some casino that night, and he just leaves before the real masseuse comes in, only for Domino to realize that he wasn't working there, which I thought was quite a funny moment. The way Bond finds his way into the casino is pretty funny too. Of course he wasn't an invited guest, but he tricks the guard. This bomb has a tiny gyroscope inside. Any lateral movement on your part and you could be served in an egg cup. If you understand what's being explained to you, nod gently. Good boy. It's one of the better jokes of the film that has a nice payoff later on in the movie when Bond leaves again. Thank you very much. The casino is supposed to be this really high level classy place, but it has a hole filled with arcade machines, which seems a bit out of place for a casino. Also, I always notice this guy in the background bearing a resemblance to Timothy Dalton. Anyway, the early 80s saw a rise in the popularity of video games. This somehow finds its way into a Bond film and Bond ends up facing Largo in a video game duel, which is just absolutely boring to watch. It does make it slightly more exciting that the joysticks give out shocks so that Bond and Largo get pain during the game, but we're still watching two guys playing an early 80s video game. After a few losses, Bond ends up winning the big finale, and instead of money, he just asks for a dance with Domino. And remember in Thunderball, when Bond had to tell Domino that Largo killed her brother, and how there was a hint of emotion present when Bond explained it to her. In this film, Jack Patachi is the brother of Domino, who also got killed by Spectre. So how does Bond handle explaining to her that her brother died in this version? Your brother's dead. Keep dancing. Really subtle, Bond. So when he gets back to his hotel, he finds Nicole dead in the bed, and you're like, oh no, who, who is Nicole again? Oh yeah, this movie's version of Paula, who we only saw once at the airport so far. Oh no, not her. So Fatima Blush was behind the killing of her, and soon speeds off, and Bond follows her on a motorbike, which is cool, because we rarely got to see Bond on a motorbike so far in the series. The chase is pretty mediocre, but I guess it's the best the action ever gets in this film. There are some gadgets to the motorbike too, but 
really though, compared to Octopussy, the movie it was competing with, it's pretty low key. And the horrendous jazzy music that goes with it in the background doesn't help either. Bond avoids getting captured by Fatima inside a truck, only to be captured anyway shortly after. And here is one of the better moments of the film, as I just really like the character of Fatima Blas herself. She's so over the top, almost like a template of Xenia on the top in the later film Goldeneye. She wants Bond to write down that she was the best sex he ever had in his lifetime, before killing him. You know that making love to Fatima was the greatest pleasure of your life? Well, to be perfectly honest, there was this girl in Philadelphia. Shut up! It's a twisted and different moment and it gives a relatively good excuse for Bond to get his pen out so that he can kill her. Sure it's shoehorned in to have a reason for Bond to use his pen and stuff, but Barbara Carrara pulls it off in this scene. It's almost a shame to see her go though, much like Fiona Volpe, her character was just one of the highlights to the movie and now there's only the dull version of Largo left and the most menacing thing he has done so far is play video games. Speaking of Largo, Bond visits him on his boat in the next scene and Largo pretty much lets Bond walk around freely on his boat so that he can sit in his perfect bunker again to do whatever he does in there. So Bond starts kissing with Domino to provoke a reaction out of Largo in which he succeeds and Bond fiddles around some more with him by setting off the fire alarm to get out the crew members and stuff and get a single out to M to let him know where he is going. The whole plan seems really elaborate and it makes little sense. But yeah, the boat goes over to North Africa, because Largo apparently has a reason to go there. Well, he really hasn't. And we finally get to see Largo become a bit more twisted and interesting as he starts to threaten Domino because he betrayed him and he, he sells her to some random Arabs and Bond gets in prison too at the top of some tower. You were a very good secret agent. Really? And Bond asks Largo where the nukes are hidden and you're like, oh yeah, the nukes, the actual plot of the movie. Because unlike Fundable, you don't really feel like the world is in danger at any moment throughout the film. And Largo tells him that the first nuke is under the White House in Washington. And you're like, so when the hell did they do that? It's never shown and it's just mentioned to be there. Of course Bond escapes easily using his laser watch and he and Domino start riding a horse only for it to be making a jump into the water from really high in a really cheap special effect which I think even audiences at the time would probably laugh at. And apparently they actually got a horse to fall into the water on his back for the ending shot which seems pretty extreme. They do have the mandatory bit in showing off that the horse is okay so I guess you could say no animals were hurt in the making of this film but they may have gotten slightly annoyed. So Felix rescues Bond and Domino and they get aboard the US Navy ship and there's a bit on the intercom where we just get to hear that the first bomb has been disabled under the White House but we never get to see it and now Bond has to find the second bomb. So you know, by this point you're faced with a real overload of tension and excitement in case you're actually still awake by this point. So Domino's necklace of the Tears of Allah actually finds its way into the plot now as it apparently holds the location of the sacred Tears of Allah tomb where the second bomb is hidden. It really stresses things far but at this point I usually don't really care that much anymore anyway. So Bond asks the commander if he's equipped with the latest XT7Bs. And that's usually the point where you're awake again and it's like oh so what could that be? I mean it just doesn't get more exciting than XT7Bs. So Bond and Lighter infiltrate this Tears of Allah place which is supposed to be this really sacred and hidden historic location hidden below an oasis that could be treasured by Muslims all around the world. Of course Lighter and Bond just destroy the crap out of it. There's some of the Navy men coming in to assist Lighter and a shootout follows between the Americans and Largo's goons and meanwhile Largo escapes with the second nuke underwater. So Bond decides to go after him by letting himself be picked up by a helicopter and getting himself trapped dropped into a well. I guess the movie has already forgotten that he has an XT7B thingy waiting outside but whatever. So Bond gets dropped into the well and he's able to see Largo coming and the movie goes into the climax. And no epic underwater war this time, just a knife fight between Bond and Largo. No tension whatsoever. 
Bond disarms the nuke and Largo is about to kill Bond, but he gets killed by a harpoon of Domino, who joins in. And so, the world is saved, even though there could still be a full-on war going on between Lighter and Largo's goons in the caves, but the movie doesn't bother to show that. So, on to the final scene we go. Bond is retiring as an agent and enjoys a bath with Domino, when Mr. Bean comes in to try and convince Bond to come back, because now apparently M does really hold him high. Only to plead for your return, sir. M says that without you in the service, he fears for the security of the civilized world. Never again. Never? Never, never say oh. never again. Never, never say never again. And so we say goodbye to Connery as Bond. Again. Because Never Say Never Again is an unofficial Bond film, I'm trying to look at it objectively. But even then, you have to come to the conclusion that it's just a pretty crappy movie. You can't hold it against the film that it doesn't have the gun barrel, the Bond theme, a title sequence with the naked chicks, or whatever other elements the official series has made us associate with our idea of what a Bond film should be. But without holding any of that against this film, it's still a movie filled with a lot of boring scenes and a terrible soundtrack. It's a weak remake that is not even half as good as the original that came out almost two decades before this one. I find it ironic that Connery was so determined to give this movie a realistic approach in the same vein as From Russia With Love. He had a big hand in the script and the casting and yet they came up with the most elaborate stupidity which is anything but set in a realistic tone. The cast is also not really special. This Largo and Domino are both a bit dull for my taste and I can see why Max von Zero could be a good Blofeld, but he doesn't really have a prominent role and I think I've said enough about Edward Fox's portrayal of M. Fatima Blush is the positive exception though. She really lifts this movie up and shines in pretty much every scene she's in. I still find it amazing how McClory actually got Connery to star as Bond though. Had it been Lazenby or David Niven or something, I probably wouldn't have watched this movie as much. Connery is nowhere near as cool as he was during the 60s, but his humor and suaveness is still on point enough and it did make for some entertaining scenes that make it at least a bit worthwhile, even if it's just for a few moments. It's still at the very least a better film than Diamonds Are Forever, I will give it that. Not in the soundtrack though, but really, if you want to watch a Bond classic starring Connery, just pop in one of the first five Bond films. To me, the Battle of the Bonds is easily won by Octopussy. <laughs>